we're going to, as I've already mentioned, return to the parable of the sower, but instead of reading this whole text, let me just read the explanation that Jesus gives, uh, beginning in verse 18 through verse 23, because that's pretty much what we're looking at this evening. Um, Hopefully you're familiar with it enough to to know uh, Jesus is using the illustration of somebody who's going out to sow the field, and uh, there's seed that falls in various places on on the uh, on the roads, basically where it's compacted, doesn't penetrate uh, among uh, soil that doesn't have much depth. There's a lot of stone underneath it. Uh, there's uh, some that fall that falls among the thorns, and then that which falls uh, in good soil. And then he gives this explanation beginning in verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word. And the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word, and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. May the Lord bless his word again to our uh, understanding this evening. Now this morning we were uh, considering that um, the enemy, uh, another one of his attacks against us is to try to weaken us by taking away our assurance. Now, he cannot take away our salvation, but he can work to take away our confidence that we are saved. As I've already mentioned, he wants to get us caught up into settling the question of our own personal safety so that we'll be so preoccupied with that that we won't serve the Lord uh, in his kingdom and in so doing threaten the devil's kingdom. Now, it is important to know that we are safe, and we asked the question this morning, how can we know that? And the answer really is this, the only way is if we know that we have God's Spirit working in our hearts. And the only way we can know that is if we see the fruit that He produces in our lives, which Paul tells us is primarily that of love, not the kind of love that the world experiences although it is similar in some ways, but it is a love for God. It's a love for the kingdom of God and everything that has to do with God because of its holiness, because of its purity, because of its moral uprightness. Uh, The difference between the love we have and the love the world has is that our love uh, has God as its object and a desire to honor and glorify Him whereas the motive of the other kind of love is, is varied and, and doesn't have anything really to do with God. Now, if we have this kind of love, then we will love God. We'll love every, every way in which He reveals Himself to us. We've already seen that uh, we will love what we see of God in nature, what He reveals in the world with regard to His Uh, well, His eternal power, His divine attributes, which Paul tells us the entire world sees and knows that God exists. We won't suppress it as the world does, that they might live with themselves, live in light of the fact that they have to answer to God, but rather we will love it and glory in it and try to point it out also to others that they might see it. We will also, of course, love the revelation of God in His Word, particularly His Gospel. We will love His Son, we will trust Jesus, we will receive Him as our Savior, and we will follow Him as our Lord. He will be our shepherd, and we will hear His voice, and we will follow Him as we've already uh, read. Now, the Spirit's work is to make us more like Jesus, and when we see that happening, we will know that we belong to Him. We will follow Jesus even as Jesus loved and served His Father, we will love and serve the Father 
and Jesus. This is the fruit that Jesus is talking about in the parable. When he says the good seed falls in the, um, uh, the good soil and produces fruit, this is that kind of fruit. Now, we also note it's not enough simply to do the right thing to do the right kinds of works, even obey the law of God, the law of God which is the standard of what is right. Because as Jesus pointed out, the scribes and Pharisees do that very thing and they prove that you can do the right thing with the wrong reasons or for the wrong reasons and with the wrong motives. We have to do what is right, but we have to do it with the right motive and that motive must be love for the Lord. So if you are trusting Jesus alone for your salvation, if you're walking in his ways because you love him, because that's what you want to do in your heart of hearts, then you can know that you belong to him. You can know that you are saved. But the last thing we noted this morning was this, that no matter how much love we have in our hearts, it's far from perfect still. We are full of flaws. There, there is still this remaining sin, this remaining corruption. And so the enemy will exploit these flaws in order to shut us up, as it were, in a cage of doubt to get us to doubt that we belong to Jesus. This is just one of his many attacks, but this is the one we're dealing with this evening. So this evening what I want us to do is look at some of these attacks and how we can refute his lies, how we can overcome him. Now, this parable suggests, I think, at least four that parallel the four responses to the gospel that, we, that Jesus tells us about in this parable. Now, the first one has to do with the fact that when the gospel is sown, that there are those who are unaffected by the gospel, and sometimes that happens to us. Jesus says in verse 19 of uh, chapter 13, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. Now, as I mentioned this morning, Jesus in the uh, first three cases, the seed sown beside the road, the seed in the rocky soil, the seed that fell among the thorns. He's talking about what happens in the case of unbelievers, what's taking place in their hearts. But we do need to understand that these things can happen at least in a similar way in our hearts as well. And when that happens, the enemy will attack us. Now, in this first instance, Jesus is telling us there are those who hear the gospel. The gospel is preached. The seed sower, the seed sower is essentially one who is basically armed with the gospel, and he's going out and he's evangelizing other people. And as he does that, there are going to be those who hear the gospel, but who don't understand it. Now, what he means by that is either they don't know what it means, or they think to themselves, how could anyone believe this kind of message in this modern world that is full of science, that it's explained really, the, uh, really uh, the existence of everything, or so they think. They do not see it essentially for what it is. They don't see its worth. They don't see its preciousness. So the devil comes and he takes it away. He essentially diverts their attention distracts them with the world, and so the encounter that they had with the gospel eventually fades away. They, they don't remember it anymore because it hasn't really taken you know, root in their hearts. Now, it's not as if the, the word has had no effect. It does have an effect on those who hear. It actually makes them grow harder. The soil of their heart was hard to begin with. That's why the seed didn't penetrate. But now, it, you might say, it becomes even more compacted. Remember, the gospel always has an effect on those who hear. It either softens them and draws them to the Lord Jesus, or by their rejecting it, their hearts become harder. Now, the net result here is that the gospel does not penetrate, doesn't grow, doesn't bear any fruit, the kind of fruit we were talking about this morning, the kind we just reviewed, the fruit of holiness, of good works out of love for God. They don't love what they hear. They don't trust Jesus, and so they do not 
obey him. The Bible says that we need to hear, we need to understand, and we need to respond to the gospel. We need to trust Jesus and follow him if we are to be saved. There must be some fruit. Uh, in a parallel passage in Luke, in Luke 8.15, again talking about the parable of the sower, Jesus says this, but the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. Now, we're, we're going to come back to that. Remember that. But um, notice there is the understanding. There is the reception. There is the holding fast. There is the bearing of fruit. And Jesus also tells us in John 15, verses 1 and 2, using again another illustration where he is the vine and we are the branches. He says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. And essentially, the, the point is this. If there, if there is no fruit, if there's no faith, no trust in the Lord, no obedience because, they love, you know, because we love the Lord, then we really do not know Jesus. And in the case here of the seed sown beside the road, there's obviously no fruit. There's no salvation. There's no conversion. Now, if we are true believers, of course that can't happen to us, but there are things that are similar to that that can happen to us, and when those things happen, the enemy attacks. Now, there are cases where we do hear the words. I mean, how often do we meet together to hear the word preached? But we lose what we hear. Maybe we don't understand it. I hope, I hope that's not the case. Try to make it as understandable as possible. Or maybe we don't agree with what it is we hear. Maybe we don't see its importance. Maybe we just don't remember it. But the bottom line is we are unaffected by it because it's no longer in our minds. It's not in our hearts. And so we don't do it, and we don't really bear any fruit based upon what it is we've heard. One thing that we need to understand about worship and what we're doing here is that the Lord has appointed worship and preaching in the worship because he desires to speak to us. And each time he speaks to us, he does it because he wants to change us. He wants to make us a little bit more like him. But maybe we don't see that happening. Maybe we're not changing. Maybe we're just staying the same, sermon after sermon after sermon. And the question is, does that mean? And the, the question can arise. Satan can certainly bring it up. Does that mean we're falling into this first category, that we really don't know the Lord? Well, the only way to refute the enemy on this particular account is, again, what we saw this morning. We must see that there actually is fruit in our lives, that we really do love the Lord, that we really are trusting in the Lord Jesus because we love him, and that we are obeying him for the same reason. Now, there are many books that have been written on the subject of assurance. And um, even though you, sometimes you read these books by the Puritans particularly who are so, um, well, full and, and uh, just all the different ways that um, uh, things that we should be seeing in our lives uh, uh, with regard to this fruit. And usually by the time you get to an end of one of their books on assurance, you're pretty much convinced there's no way you can be a Christian because... I'm nothing like that. Uh, I fall so short of that standard. And the fact is, we all do. But then they end like, um, I think it was Thomas uh, Brooks, Heaven on Earth. He ends the book by saying something he probably should have said at the beginning, which is, if you see any of these fruits in any measure, in any degree in your life, even just a little, the least little bit, and you see that it's, as Jonathan Edwards would say, motivated by a true love for God, then you can know that you are a true believer. If there is any fruit at all, then you can know that you are safe. So that's how we refute that lie of the enemy. But it does bring up another interesting point, and that is that we often don't benefit from the Word as much as we should. We too often forget what it is we've heard. 
I had a college professor who kind of uh, made a joke about this, where he said, uh, you know, that I, he, he was talking about himself. He says, I have a better forgettery than I have a memory. And I think that's probably true of all of us, isn't it? We forget more than, than certainly we've ever heard. Uh, we ha I had, um, well, even when we try to remember, it, we can still only remember so much um, because there's only so much that we can retain. Now, John Frame, who was one of my professors in seminary, uh, said this in the first class that I had, uh, first semester, first class, my initial exposure to seminary, and I'm thankful that he said this. He says, just think of seminary as a banqueting table, uh, and you have a plate, and you can fill that plate with what, what's ever on the table. You need to understand you're not going to get that whole table on the plate. You're only going to be able to get so much of that. He, he quantified it. He said 20%. You're probably going to carry 20% out of the things that you hear. So don't try, he said, to get it all. But look for what is most important and try to take hold of that. Our goal should be to gain as much as we possibly can and to lose as little as possible of what we hear. It's been said of the Jews in Jesus' day and even before that, you realize that they didn't have copies of the scriptures that they could read whenever they wanted to unless they happened to be wealthy and could afford them. Most of the Jews went to the synagogue and they had to hear the word of God read. And the question is, how were they going to benefit from that if they couldn't open it up and look at it again, refresh their minds of what it actually said. Well, the Jews uh, became good at memorizing. Uh, they memorized what they heard so they could take it home and they could use it during the week both to benefit their families and to benefit themselves. The same thing would happen during the, the days of the Puritans. They used to call the, the Lord's Day the market day of the soul. They had a market day when they'd go to market to uh, buy the groceries they needed from local farms and so forth, and they'd do their trading and so forth and gather what they needed for the week. They'd do the same thing when they went to church on the Lord's Day. They would gather up what they needed for the entire week from that sermon, uh, and they, what they would do is they would remember, or I'm not sure if they could take notes because it would be hard to do with an inkwell and a, and a quill. <laughs> so they had to remember what it is that they had uh, heard, and they became good at doing that. That's something we need to think about, training ourselves to hold on to what we hear so that we are changed by what we hear, so that we actually benefit from the Word of God and it doesn't just get taken away uh, by our, our flesh sweeping it under the rug or the enemy trying to take it away from us. It's only going to do us any good if it penetrates the soil and bears the fruit of good works based upon the Word that we actually hear. So that's one of the attacks of the enemy, and, you know, it's, it's, it is a weakness. We need to realize that it is a weakness in us. Now, secondly, the, the second group has to do with those who are affected by the gospel, um, but who fall away when things get difficult because of the gospel. We read in verses 20 and 21, the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Now, um, in, in the parable, again, of the sower, uh, we do need to understand the first example, the person didn't receive it at all. It was just swept away. It didn't, didn't affect him at all. In the remaining three, they're all affected by the gospel, but only the final one actually brings fruit. Only the final one is saved. So this represents a person who is an unbeliever who receives the word and, and continues for a while, but then falls away. So in this first one, they, they receive it, okay? They appear to receive the gospel, to have received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Perhaps they make profession of faith in a church and own him publicly. Uh, they're even overjoyed by the fact that they have. They, their reception makes them happy. They receive it with joy. But again, notice they turn away when the cost for following Jesus be, you know, becomes too high. Now, there are many examples of this in the Bible. There's examples in church history. Think about the uh, time when the Jews were in captivity and Nebuchadnezzar built that great statue, a gold statue of himself. 
And he commanded his empire to fall down and worship. We read that there were only three Jews that didn't fall down and worship that idol. And there must have been more Jews than just those three. How many professed to know the Lord Jesus Christ during the time of the Roman persecutions, but when it came down to you either worship Caesar and offer that pinch of incense or you die, how many actually caved in and offered that pinch of incense and denied the Lord Jesus because it was going to cost them their lives? They loved themselves and their lives more than him. You see, if you don't really love the Lord in the way that you need to love the Lord, we're not going to be willing to suffer for him. Um, we're not going to suffer in the way that we need to. You see, if we're not willing to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ, that means we really don't know him. Now, we need to step back and ask this question about ourselves. How many times have we been in situations um, where we've denied him, maybe not outright, but perhaps by our inactivity, in far less threatening circumstances than what these people had to face. Maybe around family members or friends, or people at work, we had a chance to speak to them about the gospel. Uh, we felt the obligation. We believed that's what the Lord was, was calling us to do. We remembered the call, the Great Commission, go into all the nations. Here's somebody who needs to hear. You need to tell them. We even, I mean, even a providential opportunity. Maybe, you know, there, there are those times when it just seems like it's the right thing to do. The Lord has prepared the way, but we kept silent, and we did because we were afraid of how they would respond to us. Now, I'm sure that's happened to you at some point in your lives. I know it's happened to me. When that happens, what happens then? Well, doesn't the enemy come in and begin to accuse you? How can you claim to be a Christian? Others have gone before you and they've had to face much more difficult things than this. Think about the three Jews I just talked about that wouldn't fall down and worship the statue, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which are their given names in Babylon. They were threatened with being thrown into a fiery furnace which would consume them to ashes, but they were unwilling to bow down and worship this statue. Hebrews chapter 11 is full of those who suffered, who even died, rather than compromise. Satan will also remind us, isn't the willingness to die for Jesus the evidence that you actually belong to him? I mean, didn't Jesus say in Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him, that is their enemy, because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life, even when faced with death, and yet you are not willing to stand a little abuse for the sake of Jesus? You see, Satan is going to take every opportunity to try to tear us apart, and sadly, there's plenty of opportunities in our lives to do that. Now, it is true, we should stand, and we should speak. The Lord has commanded us to speak. He's given us the ability to speak. He's given us the message to speak. We know that is His will, but sometimes we don't do that. Now, if we always don't do that, if we are always silent, if we always fail, then we really should examine our hearts and to see where we are with the Lord, whether we actually love Him or not. But it shouldn't be always the case. Now, Satan can attack us even more severely than this, particularly if we, if we fall even further away from the Lord than this, Satan will come to us and say, you know what, the Lord has shown you so much of his love, but you've turned your back on him time and again. I don't know how many people I've talked to, and I've even thought about it myself in my own Christian experience, where you fall into sin and you read this passage about Esau, remember who gave up his birthright for a bowl of stew. That birthright was really uh, the blessing of being the line through which Messiah would come. Now, we know that God had chosen Jacob for that, but there was a reason why Esau lost it. It's because he sold his birthright for this bowl of stew. And then when he realized what he had lost, and he was only thinking about the physical blessings, he wept before his father Isaac. And he says, don't you have a blessing for me? And as uh, the author to the Hebrews uh, ex basically explains this. He says that he could not find repentance even though he sought, sought for it with tears. 
And we tie that to the unpardonable sin, or at least Satan does, and we find ourselves in a situation where we wonder, not only am I, am I a Christian, or how could I be a Christian, but is there any hope for me that I can be saved? Now, hopefully, we're at a place where we're beyond that now, and we understand that we're not going to be lost if the Lord has saved us. But when things like this happen, we need to remember this, that none of the Lord's people have ever been perfect. Peter, remember, denied Jesus three times, that he even knew who he was. And this was after following him for three and a half years and preaching the gospel and healing the sick and perhaps even raising the dead. And when confronted with a servant girl to save his skin, he denies Jesus. John Mark abandoned Paul and uh, Barnabas on the, um, on the mission field. I think it was Barnabas. Uh, there were many who were true believers that buckled under the Roman persecution and offered that pinch of incense to Caesar. And there was a good segment of the church that basically said, you guys are out for good. There's no way the Lord is going to have mercy on you. And yet Augustine believed that they could become, well, they could come back into the church if they had truly repented. And they did repent, so many of them did it, and they were received again. Now, I think the real question is, how do we deal with these failures? Not whether we fail. We're all going to fail. But the question is, how do we deal with the failure? Do we repent? Do we love the Lord now? Are we trying to serve Him now? Are we determined that the next time we're faced with a situation like that, we are going to stand? We are going to do the right thing? We do need to understand that failure can actually make us stronger. Uh, both Peter and John Mark were better after they fell. And I imagine those who buckled under the Roman persecution and repented also discovered that the Lord would work even that together for their good. You know, sometimes the devil goes even a different direction with, uh, with the persecution, the tribulation that arises because of the word. And he might say to us, there's so many hard things that you're having to endure, so many hard things that are happening, so much persecution. God must not love you if that's the case. I mean, think about Andrew Brunson, who was in prison for a couple of years. You think Satan came to him? If, would God, does God really love you if he's going to make you suffer in this prison for this long? God doesn't love you. As a matter of fact, you can't be his because if you were his, your life would be so much easier so much nicer, you might as well just give up. You might as well stop following him, stop pretending to be a Christian. You know, the Bible tells us that we really should be more concerned if we're not suffering. Jesus told us that if we follow him, we will suffer in the world. You will have tribulation. And why is that? It's because you're in a world that hates Christ. Paul wrote to Timothy, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You shine the light in the darkness, the darkness is not like it. They're going to fight back. But we do need to remember the Lord uses even the tribulation, even the persecution to help us, to help us grow. That's, I think, what the author to the Hebrews has in mind in Hebrews 12, verses 6 through 8, where he says this, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. The idea here is that God doesn't spank us, you know, uh, discipline us, as it were, with, with a rod that is a literal rod, like we might discipline our children as they're being raised. But rather, he uses circumstances in life to teach us certain things. I mean, remember Job. Remember what he went through. That was not for nothing. It was to teach Job something. And it was also, of course, to show Satan that Job really belonged to him. So the fact that we're going through difficult times does not mean that the Lord does not love us. We must expect difficult times if we are going to follow the Lord. Sometimes the devil's going to try to convince us that we're not going to be able to hold up under all this suffering, that we're going to fall away, that we're not going to be able to endure it. But we need to remember at the same time, it does not depend upon us 
to stand under all this persecution and suffering and difficulty. We don't have the strength to do it. The only reason why we're going to stand and persevere is because the Lord has promised that he is going to hold on to us. Uh, Jesus says regarding his sheep in the Good Shepherd Discourse that we looked at in our, in our meditation this evening in chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. Those who hear his voice, those who follow him, those he gives eternal life to, he gives eternal life, they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me as a reward for his, his work is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And on the basis of this, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So the fact is that, yes, there will be persecution, there will be suffering. Sometimes we are going to buckle under it, right? Sometimes uh, we're going to be troubled by it. Sometimes we think we're going to be overwhelmed by it. But it really is the mark that the Lord loves us. And even when we do fall, the Lord exposes us to that to show us our weakness in order that he might strengthen us in that area. Now, thirdly, we might be affected by the gospel. The third, um, you know, the third soil has to do with that which fell among the thorns. It talks about those who are affected by the gospel, who receive that seed. But their desire for the world is so strong that they never actually get down to doing what the Lord saved them to do, or what he calls them actually to do. Uh, in verse 22, Jesus says this, And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world, and the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Now, our Lord tells us that we are not to love the world. 1 John 2.15, do not love the world nor the things in the world. Why? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That love of the Holy Spirit, love for God, and that's because the two are opposed to one another. Remember, he's not talking about the physical world. He's not talking about the beauty that's in the world. We enjoy looking at the Grand Canyon, going to Yosemite. That's, that's you know, actually it's, it's the creation that's been, uh, that shows the scars of, of the, the flood, and we still find it to be beautiful. There's still a lot of beauty in this world. But he's talking about those parts of the world, the world system under the control of the evil one that um, is opposed to God. He tells us not to love it. The scripture also tells us that its lure, its pull, is so strong that it can actually keep some from entering into the kingdom of heaven. Remember what Jesus told his disciples in Mark 10, verse 25. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And by the way, that eye of the needle is not a certain small gate in Jerusalem that's difficult for camels to get through. He's talking about the eye of a needle that's used for mending things. That's impossible. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And remember the response of the disciples when they heard Jesus said this, if that's the case, who can be saved, right? I mean, it's not just difficult, it's impossible because the rich are the ones that have the leisure to pursue the kingdom of heaven, whereas the others have to work for a living. If they can't be saved, who can be saved? Well, the problem is, is the fact that having these possessions, if they have hold of you, they may keep you from entering into the kingdom because Jesus tells us if we come to him, we must be willing to give up all those possessions. This is what he said to the crowds in Luke 14, who were following him. None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Now, I don't think that the Lord meant by that, that you couldn't own anything, but you need to have a loose hold on whatever the Lord says. Hey, I want you to give that. You need to give that. You need to give this up. You need to give that up. But he knows that we need things to take care of our needs and our families and, and even have an inheritance for our children. It's not wrong to have possessions, but our possessions cannot possess us. But that's also why the Lord, by his Holy Spirit, gives us the ability 
to be willing to do that because of, of, the, of the value that we see in his kingdom. Think about the parables that Jesus spoke in Matthew 13, uh, just beyond the parable of the sower, the parable of the treasure hidden in the field and the pearl of great price. Listen to what he says. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field so that he can possess the treasure. See, he gives up everything for it. Again, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. That is what the Spirit of God does in the hearts of those who see the value of the kingdom of heaven. They are willing to do what Jesus said, give up all their possessions in order to have that kingdom. And that's why holding on to the world may prevent us from coming into the kingdom. It will choke out the seed and it won't bring any fruit because, again, we love the world more than we love the kingdom. We're not willing to give it up. It's still our God, still our idol. You know, there's many people today who claim to love Jesus Christ but are using Jesus to get rich. They don't really love him. They're just merchandising with Jesus. And there are many more who set Jesus aside, their commitment to him when he gets in the way of their getting something that they really want in this world. I mean, ask, we all need to ask ourselves this question. Have there been times when we have compromised when we have set aside what we know is right in order to pursue something, whether it was good or bad, that if we were faithful to the Lord, we knew that we could not have that, we should not have that, but we pursued it anyway. We sort of turned our Christianity off and went after that. Have we been willing to let go of the things that we want in this world? When we came to Christ, the things that would lead us away from the Lord and His kingdom, you know, the fact is we've all compromised with the world at one time or another. And again, Satan has been there to accuse us. Now, if that's all we do, if the, all we do is compromise and we, we don't get down to doing what the Lord calls us to do because we're so caught up in the world and the things of the world, then we are, in fact, thorny ground hearers and we do not know him. But if we've compromised and we've turned around to the Lord again because we really do love the Lord more than the world, then we really do belong to Him. Again, we've already been reminded by the examples we've seen in Scripture. We're not perfect. There's a lot of sin that is still in our hearts. We're still going to be tempted by the world. And there will be times when we fall to it. Maybe many times we fall to it. But if we belong to the Lord, the Good Shepherd is always going to seek us and bring us back because as we've already seen, the Lord will never lose any of his people. Now finally, there is that last group of people who receive the gospel and bear fruit. As we saw this morning, again, in differing amounts, verse 23. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty and some 30. You know, Satan can use that passage to accuse us as well. And he might go about it this way. You're only producing 30. <laughs> but look, there's others that are producing 60. And look at this one. He's producing, she's producing a hundredfold. You're not doing nearly as much as you could. Others have done so much more than you. You're really nothing in comparison. Do you really love the Lord? Do you really know the Lord? Now, again, I think the answer to that is, is pretty clear. When that happens, we do need to remember the only reason there's any fruit in our lives is because of God's grace. And if there is fruit, there is grace. And if there is grace, then we are saved. We need to remember there's many reasons why we might bear differing amounts of, of fruit. Some of these reasons are outside of our control, entirely in the Lord's hands. He's given to each of us different gifts. Spurgeon, I think we're pretty much all of us familiar with Spurgeon. He had a photographic memory. He could basically photocopy books when he would read them, and they'd all be in his mind from that time on. He could quote 
basically the page and what was on the page, and he could draw from that library while he was preaching. That's a tremendous gift, one that I certainly don't have. Edwards was a genius. Whitfield was a natural orator. I mean, he would have succeeded in any speaking environment, but the Lord took hold of his heart. Wesley, what was his gift? Well, he was certainly intelligent. I'd say his was a strong constitution. The guy labored tirelessly. So we all have differing gifts, and they will have a bearing on how much fruit we, we bear. We all have different callings. Some of those callings will lend itself more to bearing fruit than others, such as doing missionary work. If you're doing missionary work all day long, you're likely to bear more fruit for the kingdom, perhaps, than if you're having to work <clears throat> some kind of a, another type of job. Some are given divinely ordained opportunities. They are put by the Lord in a specific place at a specific time to do a specific job that, you know, the reverberations of which continue to echo down, as it were, to the present. Now, John Calvin, certainly a man who was gifted, but, you know, he wanted simply to be a, a teacher. He wanted to be a quiet scholar. He wanted to study. He wanted to teach and um, <coughs> basically wanted to do it without all the, uh, all the threats. But necessity compelled him to return to Geneva to become a leader in the Reformation. And the consequences of that are still being felt today. There are things that are simply outside of our control with regard to how much fruit we will eventually bear. But there are also things that are in our control, like what we do with what the Lord has actually given to us, what we do with our time, with our strength, with our resources, uh, how much time we spend in the Word, how much time we spend in prayer and in worship whether we're really working to overcome our fears, putting our sins to death, trying to do more for the Lord. Now, I think we would all admit that we could all do more if that is what we really wanted to do. Well, the only way we can want to do that more, of course, is to immerse ourselves in the Word and in prayer and, and to seek the Lord's grace. And that's what we need to do. Because bearing fruit for the Lord's glory is why we're here. Now, in closing, uh, I, I just want to make sure we understand that, you know, Satan does attack. We understand that. But we need to understand there's a reason why he attacks. Now, he's trying to weaken us. But the Lord has a reason why he's allowing Satan to attack. And that is because he wants to expose our weaknesses. The Lord knows what our weaknesses are. He wants us to be able to overcome them. And if he has used the devil to expose these weaknesses in us, we can be sure that the Lord also wants us to work on those particular weaknesses, to close up the breaches so that we will be stronger in him that we might serve him better. So as we think again about the attacks of the enemy, particularly in this area, we're only going to be vulnerable in our weak areas. And it's not wise for us not to know our weak areas. And so the Lord will allow Satan to, to test us in these particular areas to point them out so that we might become stronger. <coughs> so as we think through what we've just looked at, think about where you need to become stronger. Is it in remembering the Word of God and letting it penetrate? in standing up for the Lord in situations where maybe something is threatened, comfort levels are threatened, maybe even your life? Does it have to do with how much of the world you're involved in and imbibing? Is that choking the, the word in your life and making it less fruitful? Uh, is it a matter of being jealous uh, of those who have greater gifts or maybe not using the gifts that the Lord has given to you to your best advantage? <laughs> we all have things that we need to learn. So may the Lord give us the grace to do what he has shown us we need to do that we might be stronger, that we might have more of his Holy Spirit, that we might have a stronger assurance, and that we might be able to do more for him. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's uh, ask the Lord uh, he might apply these things to us. <clears throat>